accurate and was uh, was good um, that's that's not the, that's not the issue uh, there was two issues uh, the first one there's just so much more I want to share with you than what they're sharing on the video uh, even though it's si over six weeks it's very limiting and so I got to think about how am I going to take and incorporate all this in watch a 30 minute video and then spend the other 30 minutes uh, kind of hashing over what you just looked at. I thought, I, I don't know. I, I can teach as good as he can. <laughs> that's arrogant, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> but that's, that's the reality. He's got a PhD and I got a DMN. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, but it, it was good, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to use it. But here's the biggest factor. When I pulled up, there was two CDs in the, in the thing, and one of them is the six uh, teaching sessions, and the other is like uh, with uh, PDFs and things of that nature. Uh, that um, uh, and and one of them was uh, actually a, a licensure thing, and I pulled up the licensure, which I shouldn't know. I, I pulled up the licensure, and just as clear as day, this video series cannot be used, uh, cannot be transmitted transmitted by the internet. Uh, or cannot be placed on the internet uh, in any form. And so since we are recording these and we are putting them on the internet, I couldn't use the series anyway, not, not legally. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, Facebook is notorious. They, they, have, they have deemed us several times on copyright violations of some clips that we used and things of this nature. So, uh, so they, 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 there is a watchdog out there somewhere uh, looking at all that. So, of course, if it's, if it's illegal, it's illegal, and I'm not going to do anything that is illegal. Uh, so, uh, that's that, but that's the main reason I didn't use it was because I can't, I can't put it, I, you know, we would not be able to um, record this and put it out there. And so, since we plan to do that, I, I, I'm not going to do that. So, anyway, anyway, so we're not going to do the video, uh, but um, so you're going to have to listen to me. Uh, but anyway, um, so we want to go to the Lord in prayer, and boy, I'm telling you what, there's just sickness, sickness, sickness everywhere you look. Um, continue to pray for Miss Nene. You know, she had, she, she had a cancer, so it was a basal cell cancer. That thing was nasty, um, but uh, she had a basal cell cancer on her arm, and they removed that yesterday. And I have not heard from her today, but she, she got along. She got along well with that, and they removed that. Uh, and she also had COVID, but she, I think she's pretty much over that. Uh, they wouldn't have done the surgery if she had not been. Um, but uh, there's a CC, she or co-worker. She was exposed uh, to a co-worker uh, with COVID, and so she's having to quarantine uh, for a little bit. Uh, and I could list... I could, I could list a whole list of people, uh, some you may know or some you may not know, that have COVID. Uh, and so, um, so let's continue to pray for everybody that's sick and everybody that's been sick and everybody's going to get sick. <laughs> so so that's, that is the reality. Uh, if you hadn't been sick, you probably are going to be sick, but hopefully, hopefully not. And uh, so we can... Uh, we can pray for all of these situations. Uh, do you have a prayer need you want to share with us this evening uh, as we pray? Amen. 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 Lots of stuff. I remember we are in a, a week of prayer and fasting, and uh, so um, just as, as, as you see fit to fast, as you see fit to uh, seek the Lord, um, you do that. Uh, during this week, we, we'll have, I think about, there's, there's two or three other times scheduled in the calendar year, 
that we'll have a week of prayer and fasting and uh, seeking the Lord. That's so important. We all need time to step away from the cares of our lives and our thoughts and our appetites. And uh, I can't tell you how to fast. I can tell you what to do. I can tell you some things to do. But I think that's a, that's a very individual thing of how you fast. Um, you know, um, some, some say, well, I can't fast food. Um, well, I, I, know there's, there's, I know sometimes people on medication, but don't tell me there's not something in the food category you can fast. And, uh, and it's, I, I've, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Uh, people, you know, some people fast television, which has fast social media. You want to get off of that. You want to, you want to quit that. Uh, that, that that's, your, that's my opinion. That's my opinion. Um, you know, I, but, but when it comes to fasting, I'm not saying these things are not legit, but when it comes to fasting, the Bible always only talks about food. It does not talk about, you know, other things. It always, in regards to fasting, it's always fasting some kind of food. Um, whether it be a meal, uh, and I realize there are people who cannot fast a whole meal. I, they, people have uh, health issues, health concerns, take medication that they have to have food with. I, I understand that. This is not legalism. God is not going to zap you dead. And let me tell you, if, uh, while you're fasting, if you slip up and you uh, go by the candy jar, you're fasting sweets, and you go by the candy jar and you just instinctively reach in and get a handful of those M&Ms, and they're in your mouth before you even know what has happened, um, God is not going to strike you dead. I mean, you know, if, if, we, if we fail, if we... Uh, don't live up to it. So it's not, it's not that. And, and a lot of people want to make it so legalistic. And, you know, if you, if you, you got to do it to the letter of the law. Uh, I remember um, uh, a lady, she has since passed away. But uh, their church, um, the pastor, uh, they were doing, uh, uh, again, it's been a few years ago, uh, you know, 21 days of prayer and fasting. And she said, I can't go 21 days without food. I said, who, who told you that you had to go 21 days without food? I said, did your pastor tell you that? Oh, no, no. But when I was growing up, when the old folks fasted, they didn't eat anything. And he wants us to fast for 21 days. And I can't, I can't do it. I never could get her to see because she was so entrenched in what was ingrained in her as a child. She could not see past that you can spend 21 days of fasting something, if it's a meal or if it's a certain kind of food or doing something that will remind you, hey, I need to pray. I've, I'm, my dependence is on God. You know, that, that's what it's all about. That's what fasting is all about. It helps you reconnect and get in touch. So, uh, so, so uh, spend some time. Uh, if you haven't started yet, it's not too late. Uh, spend, but spend some time in, in prayer and, and in fasting. So that's what we want to do right now. I've spent a lot of time talking, instructing. So let's, let's, let's spend some time and let's uh, go to the Lord and let's ask him uh, to help us and to bless us. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for just giving us this opportunity to come back again into your house, to come and to sit, Lord Jesus, under your word, because it is your word, to listen, Lord, as the Holy Spirit teaches us. Lord, I, I'm, I'm just an instrument. I'm just something that is used in the hand of God. And so, Lord, it's not just my words. It's not just what I teach. It's not just what I say. God, it is... It is the spirit of the living God using us and the word and the spirit can speak to our own hearts and our minds and our souls. And Lord, and while we're doing this week of prayer and fasting and, and what we're doing here, 
And I just pray, God, that we will spend some time, take some time alone, and Father, Lord, reconnect with you. Reconnect our spirits with you. When we're feeling drained and tired and weary mentally and physically and spiritually, Father, Lord, sometimes we have to just get connected back to the power source. It's just like a, a battery that's going dead. Lord, that battery can be charged back up. And so, Father, Lord, I just pray that you, we will use this time to recharge, re-energize, renew uh, ourselves, Lord, in you. For, Lord, you are the great God and the almighty God, and we love you and we thank you and we praise you and we lift you up because you are worthy to be lifted up and you, O oh God, are worthy to be praised. Father, Lord, help us as I've, I've talked about us going through change uh, and, and help us, God, to understand, to realize. Now, I understand everybody's not going to be on this. People are going to be critical. People are going to be resistant. People are going to say we're not going to change nothing. I understand that, God. But the reality of it is we're all going to change. We're all going to change locations one day. We're all going to change residence one day. We're all going to change from this earthly experience one day. God, we're all going to change. So, Father, Lord, help us to learn how to change in the right way. Change so we will do the will and the purpose and the work of the Almighty God. So, Father, Lord, in this process that we'll, we'll be going through, Lord, help us, Lord Jesus, not to change for change's sake, but change for a purpose, change for a reason, change for what is good and for the kingdom of God. Father, Lord, bless everyone that's sick among us. Bless everyone that needs a touch from heaven. Father, Lord, you, you know the list. You see the list. And all of us have people that we know of that are sick, either with COVID or colds or flus or uh, some sort of infections, uh, people that uh, are getting uh, less than uh, the, the settling reports from the medical field. Uh, Lord Jesus, the thoughts of cancer, Lord, are so unsettling. And so, Lord, we pray, God, for this one that, that uh, is, is maybe anticipating a bad report. God, you, you have your own report. So, Lord, we pray that you'll help each and every one of those. We pray for those that, Lord, uh, that, that are not with us and, and, God, those that need to be with us. We pray for the lost of our community, God. We pray, Lord Jesus, that as a church, we'll, we'll start having a burden. Me as a pastor, sometimes I realize, Lord, that have I lost my passion for the, for the lost? Have I lost my passion for those that, that don't know you? And Father, Lord, that's something the church should never lose the passion for because that was your heart. Your heart is to seek and to save those who are lost. Your message was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So God, help us, please, God, help us. If we've lost that fire, if we've lost that, that, that vigor, if we've lost that vitality, if we've lost that, that vision, then God, help us to regain that vision again so that we can be about the work of the Master. And now, Lord Jesus, just bless our time together, and we'll give you praise for it all. For it's in Jesus Christ's name we ask it. Amen and amen. amen. Okay, so um, we, 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 we did a, a little bit of uh, introduction uh, to the Bible. We talked about the diversity and the unity uh, of the Bible uh, and how uh, it is a very diverse book, uh, but yet at the same time there is unity within uh, that, that, that thing we call, we call the Bible. Now, we're going to get to something that is, oh, God, is, this is a sleeper. I'm going to go ahead and tell you. It, it, it is, this, this, this is tough for me. And so if it's tough for me, I know it's probably going to be equally as tough uh, for you. But we're going to talk about biblical criticism. Now, when we look at the word criticism, we often think negative, right? You know, cr criticism is negative. Well, that, that is not necessarily the case. We're not talking about in a negative sense. Biblical criticism in the realm of scholarship is about methods and means of interpretation. Now, whether we like it or not, I know what it says in, in, in 
uh, I think it's Second Timothy or, or somewhere in there. You know, that, 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 that no scripture is by private interpretation. And a lot of people throw that out. Look, here's the reality. Folks. I, you know, I know you say, well, you're, you're contradicting. We, we may talk about that a little bit later. And you may say, well, you're just contradicting what the, what the Bible says. No, uh, there, there is a reason why that is there. But we are all interpreting the Scripture. If you read the Bible, you're interpreting the Bible. You've got to come up. Interpretation deals with what? What does interpretation deal with? What it means. That's right. Interpretation, what it means to me, what it means to you, what does this mean? And we all are involved in interpreting the scriptures. Uh, it, it's, just, it's just a matter of fact. Now, how we interpret the scriptures, that becomes the real issue. And how do we interpret it to the point that we believe that the interpretation is correct? It's the right interpretation. As we know, throughout history, there have been people who have taken the Bible, they have attempted to interpret and we have had a lot of false doctrine. We have had false religions. We have had all kinds of things rise to the forefront because somebody didn't get it right or saw it. I think they're on they're, that, that's, that's on the fringe. That, that's, that's, but there's a way of interpreting the Scripture. Now, some of these I take a lot of opposition to. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to... I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you some to these things, but I'm also going to tell you that some of it I view with a lot of skepticism about how using this method to interpret. But it's out there, and this, so I'm going to expose you what uh, students are exposed to in seminary. Okay? So, uh, but it is, it is so complicated. <laughs> oh, God, it is, it is so complicated. And I, 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 I despise it, but, I, but it's, I think it's necessary. So we're going we're, we're, we're to look at it. Now, biblical criticism. Again, criticism are methodologies used to analyze and interpret the biblical text. That's, that's all biblical criticism is. It's about interpretation. Now, in interpretation... There are basically two broad spectrums, okay? There's two broad categories that are subdivided into different things. The first is what is called historical criticism. And this is an analysis of the history of the text. And this is, this is, this is really dealing more with the context in which the Bible was written. The history. The history is not uh, just what time period it was written in, but with that is culture, oral traditions. I think we, 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 we talked about that, that much of the Bible before it was written down was passed from one generation, from one family to another. It was passed orally. So there's, there, there, there are factors into this, what is called oral traditions. How these stories were related again and again. That's all part of the historical context of, of the Bible. So it's looking at, again, culture. It's looking at uh, uh, the time frame. It's looking uh, at, at a lot of different factors in the historical setting of that, of that book, uh, where it came from. Because remember that the Bible itself was written uh, over about, some say a thousand years, uh, some say 1,500 years, so somewhere between a thousand and 1,500 years, this, this thing was written. Uh, the longest part was the Old Testament. Uh, and the, most of the New Testament, well, matter of fact, all the New Testament was written within a time frame of about a hundred years. So, the rest of it is the recording of the Old Testament. 
So, uh, so if you go for 1,500 years, it's 1,400 years of recording, of compiling, of putting together all the oral traditions, all the things been passed by, passed down, all written, and putting that together uh, into, into the Old, Old Testament. So that, that, that makes sense. So we're talking about the historical context. Now, another broad area is the literary, what is called literary criticism. Now, this analyzes the literary features of the text. Because remember that the Bible is, is, is not made up of pictures. I know I've said that many times. I wish it was. I, I, I do. I, I wish there was a pictorial version of the Bible. Uh, I, think, I think I could understand it better. Uh, it's a shame that the Bible was, not, was, was written and compiled before uh, the advent of uh, movies. Uh, of course, the, Hollywood got hold of it, and you know, they, they mess it up all the time. Uh, so maybe that's, maybe that's not good. Uh, but but literary, so, so literary deals with how the written form of the Bible is all put together. You know, grammar. As, as I tell my students all the time, uh, especially in preaching and interpretation of the scriptures, all we have are words. You don't have a picture. The way, uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure I've said this here before, but I said it again. The, the, way, the way I look at it and, and, and getting students to understand this, and I don't know if it's a good way or not, is... Um, I, I used to, I, I, I've quit looking at it, but y'all remember that the, the uh, television series come on, C, uh, CSI, Crime Scene Investigation. I, I love that because I love this idea of mystery. Mystery, as far as literature, that's probably one of my favorite forms of literature is mystery. I love Agatha Christie. Uh, she, she is one of my favorites. I, I just love this idea of trying to figure out a plot and trying to figure out where that thing is going. And so that's what I tell my students in, in, in preaching because it's not just about preaching, but you've got to get in there. You've got to figure out what's going on in that context. And all you've got, it's not like a real crime scene investigation because they go in and when they go into a crime scene, what are they looking for? Clues. Evidence. And what are they going to do with those clues and evidence? They're going to analyze it. And after they analyze it, what are they going to do with it then? They're going to put it all together and create a story. <laughs> They're going to create a case. They're going to create a story of what happened in that scene. Well, in reality, when you approach the scriptures, that's a lot of what you do. But you don't have real bodies. You don't have blood spatter. Uh, you don't have fingerprints. You don't have, but what do you have? Words. You have words. And so then you've got to go in and look at those words, how they are related to one another, how they are strung together grammatically, because all language has some form of grammar, and grammar is just how you put together words, right? Right? That's what it is. That's what grammar is. And so in literary criticism, that's what, that's, that's, that's what we do. We try to interpret the scriptures. Certainly you have to take into consideration the historical background. You have to take in consideration the context in which it was written, the cultures, the times, the customs, the traditions, all of that, you have to take all that in consideration. But then you also have to take in consideration how those words were strung together. One of the things that, uh, that, 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 uh, that I teach the students is you look for big words 
and you look for little words. And sometimes the little words have the greater significance. But your big words form the foundation or the outline or the structure. And then those little words are often those connectors like and, therefore, wherefore, henceforth. So when you, when you see, in, you're, you're reading along in the scriptures and you see therefore, for instance, let me, let me, give, you, let me give you a biblical for instance. In the book of Hebrews, um, chapter 11, there's this whole string, this hall of fame of faith that is laid out, that the writer here is trying to use these as inspiration for this community of faith and saying to them, you know, look at your ancestors. Look at Abraham. Look at Isaac. Look at Jacob. Look at Rahab. Look at all of these others and how by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. And then he comes to chat. Then we come, then we come to chapter 12 and he says, therefore, since you're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us look unto Jesus Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. So you see, that little therefore connects everything he said prior to that with what he is about to say. So therefore becomes a very important connective word. Okay, I know I'm born to live in daylights out of it. But this is how you, you, you look at the literary style. Now, one of the things that we discover about the, about the Scripture, um, we, we don't see it quite as much in, um, in, in the Old Testament, even though you see it some there, but you really see it uh, in, the, in, in the New Testament. Um, you know, we, we talked about last week that as far as uh, inspiration goes, which, you know, we, we believe that the Bible is inspired God by God. It's, it comes from the breath of God. But we, one of the things we talked about is that, that the men that wrote the Scriptures were not necessarily uh, uh, just taking dictation. They were not just listening to God, and, and God was speaking, and they were, they, they were scribbling down as, as, as much as they could. Now, in some cases, there were direct things from God, but that's not always the case. So when we, when, we look at that, when we look at that particular feature, we see that, especially in the New Testament, for we see that when you look at, let me go back to Hebrews for a moment. Whoever, and that's the only book in the New Testament, we don't know who wrote it. We don't know who wrote Hebrews. Remember, I gave you a little test last week. We don't, we don't, we don't know we don't, who wrote Hebrews. There's no, there's no, there's no, it's not ascribed to anyone. But when you look at, let's say, the style, the literary style, the writing style of Hebrews, and you compare that, let's say, of the Gospel of Mark. Now, now I can't see it. You can't see it. But when you look at the original, or you look at how it was written in the original language, the Gospel of Mark, and John Mark is the one who is, this is, uh, you remember the, 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 the young boy uh, that uh, Paul and Barnabas fell out over? That's John Mark. He's the one who wrote the Gospel of Mark. His writing style is very rough. And you can tell that he was not highly educated. But you take the writing style of whoever wrote Hebrews is very polished, very formal, very structured, very correctly done grammatically. So you see, God used the unique 
characteristics of each writer to write. So, so again, we look, at the, we look at these literary styles. Now, let me, let me go just a little bit further. Let's, let's, let's look at the historical criticism just for a moment. Now, in, there, there's, there's several different forms of criticism or that, that go into historical criticism, and one of them is called form criticism. Now, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you that this is probably one that I have some issue with, that I, I, I don't, I just have some issues with it. <clears throat> but form criticism, let me, let me see if I can explain it to you as best as I can. All through seminary, I had to deal with this junk. No, <laughs> I, had, I had to deal with this stuff, and, and it gave me problems. Uh, but I, I did it. Uh, I didn't agree with it, but I did it. Form criticism. It's identification and analysis of oral spoken traditions that lie behind written documents. Okay. As, as, as I told you, early, early on, a lot of the stories, a lot of the things came through oral traditions. Eventually, they were written down. They were recorded. And, and what form criticism does, especially you see it in the New Testament, but you see it in the Old Testament uh, uh, quite a bit. And, and, and actually, they've changed the, the textbook I was using. Uh, they've changed the form criticism. When I studied it, it was called higher criticism. That, that's, that's how it's referred to as higher criticism. <clears throat> okay. I don't know if y'all prepared for this. Especially in the first five books of the Bible, and especially the book of Deuteronomy. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hone in on Deuteronomy. Now, I, I'm giving you a very simplistic, and for those of you that are looking at this online, some of you scholars out there, just hold your criticism, okay? Because I, I, I'm not giving an in-depth snapshot of all of this stuff. I'm just giving you a, a very glossed over. But in, in form criticism is we typically, uh, we say that uh, Moses wrote the five, first five books of the Bible. But we know he couldn't have written all of it. Because especially when you get to Deuteronomy, there's portions he could not have written because his death was recorded in Deuteronomy. And I don't think he recorded his own death. So somebody else had a hand in writing it. We don't know who. But in, in, in this kind of criticism, this kind of interpretation, what they do is, is, is they say that there were a lot of traditions, oral traditions, uh, uh, these stories being passed down. And so they're looking at where these traditions came from historically. What sources did they come from? And in a minute, you want to flash up like source criticism, which falls under this. So, like in, in um, there were all different kinds of sources, they say. There was what was called the Jehovahist. And these were people who had a certain theological slant there were what was called the Elohist, and they were ones who had a certain theological slant. There were the priestly class, those priests that, that, that had some of the oral traditions, wrote down the oral traditions. Um, you had, oh God, I don't, I, don't, I don't know, there may be others. So, in, so those who follow this kind of criticism, this, this method of interpretation, so they're reading a sentence or they're reading a paragraph. And so they, they, they break all this stuff up and say, okay, well, this has the wording of the priestly class. But see, there was more than one priestly class. There was a priestly class one and a priestly class two and a priestly class three. And so this phrase sounds like a priestly class one. 
So this must be a P1. Well, the next phrase may sound like, well, that's an Elohist phrase that would come out of an Elohist tradition. So that must come from the Elohist. Then the next phrase, and, I, and again, I'm exaggerating. And then the next phrase may, well, that's, that's a Jehovahist. So they break all of this stuff down into where they believed these sources came from. I, I just have to believe that God somehow... <laughs> the, 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 is, this is... I, I tell you, it, it, can, it can be stretched in the limits. And I think it can open the doors to a lot of misinterpretation that can never be validated. So that's, that's the reason, as I've, I've said many, many times, there are just some things we have to believe by faith. We have to accept by faith. We can try to tear all this stuff down. We can try to bring it all down, which there was, I should have popped that. Source criticism, you know, again, that's identifying written sources behind the biblical text. So that, that all forms, that the, the form criticism and the, 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 is, it deals a lot with the oral traditions. The uh, source criticism deals with the written traditions, and they all kind of work hand in hand. Uh, trying to figure out where these came from and how they were all pieced together. Uh, and, and you, you, don't, you don't give a hoot nanny about it, and I understand. Uh, but I just, want to, I just want to introduce you to it so you understand when, when, you, when you read some things and you study some things, where do they come up with that from? Well, this is, this is where a lot of it come up from. See, up until the period of the, of the Enlightenment, uh, which, which I'm not sure was an enlightening as, <laughs> as it was supposed to be, when we come up to the period of lightning, of the Enlightenment, when people began, were, were sign, it's not that scientific ideologies and scientific theories didn't exist, they did, but they really started coming to the forefront during that period, what is called the Enlightenment. And that was in the period of what was called the age of rationalism, where everything can be explained rationally. The Bible, up until that particular point in time, had never been under any strict scrutiny. It was just accepted. It was just accepted. And so, but then when you've got people who started rising up and started with all these scientific evidences, and all these other things that were coming up. Now the scriptures come under scrutiny. So how can you say God created everything? And he created in how many days? Scientifically, that doesn't work out. That doesn't, that, that's, that's not rationally possible. And so everything dealt with rationalism. And so with that, got thrown out a lot of the, uh, of the supernatural work of God. God is a supernatural being. He is a supernatural God. He's the God of miracles. He is the one who can intercept in our mundane, routine, everyday lives. And he can upset our apple cart. He's the one who can heal, contrary to what science says. He can change the course of human events, contrary to what anybody believes. So, 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 so with this, with, with this interpretation, this is where a lot of this came in. When the Bible started coming under scrutiny, then somebody had to try to rationally, that's the reason I have a problem with some of this. It's because they're trying to rationalize the Bible. And there's some of it you just can't rationalize. There's some of it just doesn't. 
But we also know with, with, with advent of scientific discoveries, it's, they don't like to admit it, but some of these scientific discoveries only validate what was in the scriptures. Validated. Now, some of these who won't discount the word of God, they, they'll, 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 they'll throw that stuff out. They, they, won't, they won't follow that. And so, 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 again, when I look at some of this stuff, I realize, yeah, there may be some value to it, but let's don't be over-rational. Let's don't throw out because you can't figure out how God to take and speak to a man and tell him to raise your rod over a body of water and that water separates and over two million people walk through on dry land. Just because you can't rationalize that, that cannot happen in the physical realm. Well, we're not talking about the physical realm. We're talking about the supernatural realm of God. No, man can't do that. How can a man survive that's thrown into a den of hungry, half-starved, vicious lions and stay there all night and not be mauled? So there's a lot of people who discount that story because it doesn't fit. Rational, logical reasoning. But if God made a line, He could shut its mouth. He can bring those three boys out of that fire. That's exactly right. That is the supernatural work of God. So, in, so that's the reason I, I keep saying that sometimes when we read this story, even though they may not fit in our nice little even though it may not fit somewhere in there, it doesn't mean it's not true. Okay? So this is where I come down with interpretation. With that, okay, then there is what is called redaction criticism. Redaction simply means an editor. And so the, 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 the idea behind redaction, especially this is in the New Testament, is the gospel writers edited, arranged, and altered their sources to achieve a particular theological purpose. In other, in other words, what they, what they did with redaction is they took all these stories and they had a certain theological position they wanted to present. And so they used these as a means of getting that point across. Again, you got to have, pro you, you know, I, I, I believe these men were inspired. See, I think some of this stuff takes inspiration out. And that's been some of the criticism from people like me. There's other people who are smarter than I who think I'm crazy. But hey, I think they're just as crazy as I, I, as I think they are. Redaction. Okay, so that's historical criticism, literary criticism. Um, it's what is called narrative criticism. This is analyze the narrative nature of the text to determine how plot, character, and setting function to produce the desired effect upon the reader. And so, um, you know, when, when, you, when, when you think about this stuff, you're trying to figure out the mind of God. God knows how to put these stories together. God knows how to, how to help these people think and write and put it all together to convey his message. See, when I read this kind of stuff, it sounds like men are manipulating all of this. Maybe that's not the intent behind all this. That's the way I see it. Yes, stories were compiled. These things were put together, yeah. 
and they're put together through a person, but I believe the Holy Spirit is superintending all of this. And that's what I want you to hear, and that's what I want you to see. Okay, so this narrative. Then there is rhetorical criticism. This analyzes how the authors use uh, literary devices to persuade or influence people. Rhetoric, this rhetoric, rhetoric, actually, this was the primary form of education in the Roman, the Greco Roman uh, world. Aristotle, everybody have heard of Aristotle? Plato? These others? Uh, um, philosophers? This is rhetorical criticism of using these literary devices at rhetoric as a way. It's like persuasive speech. How can I persuade a group of people to believe, to do, to act the way I want them to? That's what it's all about. So, um, canonical criticism. Now, canonical criticism examines the role that the, that the books uh, play in the authoritative, the authoritative canon in the life of the church. In other words, those books that are part of what we call the canon, we're going to talk about the canon a little bit, uh, with the canon, how do, these, how do these books affect the life, the community uh, of the Christian, the Christian community? Okay, they're, they're influenced there. Okay, uh, structuralism is, is meaning is found in the deep structures intrinsically in, 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 encoded in the text. Th this, this is how it's not just what people may be thinking. It may not be plots. It may not be characters. But it's how all this stuff is just deeply woven together to form this story. So you're looking at structure. And, I, and look. I, 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 I told you this, 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 this stuff's not going to be that, that interesting. I warned you. <laughs> so it's a different. Um, reader response criticism. Now, this is going to get real interesting to me. Because I think this is, because Cynthia, I'm not picking on, I'm picking, picking on you, Cynthia. But something, something, something you said goes a lot what it means to me. This is reader response criticism. The meaning is determined by the reader, not by the structure, not by the intent of the original author. It doesn't take in consideration the context, historical context. It doesn't take into consideration culture. It doesn't take into consideration of it. In other words, I read the Bible... And, and I just, okay, if that's what it means to me, then that's what it means. Well, there's a lot of people going wrong with that method. That, that has been one of the flaws that is kind of, and, and, and don't, don't, I am not anti Small groups. Matter of fact, that's that's one of the things I'd love to see us develop here: some small groups, because I think they're important, important to the life of the church, and, and I can prove that biblically. But that's been one of the fallacies that's come out of the of, of the small group movement. Is 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 you've got leaders and you've got a, a small group of people, and they're 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 doing what is called inductive Bible study. Okay, you don't have to, don't have to worry about that. In other words, what we, what we do, we sit around in a circle, we deal with the passage of scriptures. Now tell me, what does that mean to you? Well, you've got to take into consideration of when this thing was written, some about why it was written, to whom it was written, the original purpose it was written, those things, you cannot throw those things out the door. You cannot sit in the group and then, well, I think that means this. Well, no, I hear, the, I hear this. 
Now, I have to have no opposition. I don't, I don't, I, I don't want to make anybody mad. Uh, I don't have any opposition. Because you hear me say, I, I, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. But you've got to weigh that against the Word itself. Just because you heard something in your ear, oh, I think that's what that means. That doesn't necessarily mean that what, that's what that means. And sometimes it may, if, if it's contrary, see, I believe the Bible interprets itself. And that you have to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So that's when you, you, you have to... That, that's, that's right. You can't take that one verse or those few words and let that tell the whole story. So this idea of reader response criticism is just because I say that's what it means, then that's what it means. Uh-uh. you got to have more than that. Okay? Now, here, here I love this one. <clears throat> Liberationist and... Feminist criticism. Now, this, is, this, this, this goes beyond this. This is reading and interpreting the text from a particular viewpoint. And they use in here liberationist. In my opinion, that's just another way of saying a bunch of liberals that don't want to... Uh -huh. Thank you. They want it their way. And, and, and feminists, looking, you know, some years ago, some, someone came up with the female Bible. And all references to God, because, look, I didn't write it. I didn't create it. I don't think God is anti-female. I don't think the Bible's anti. I don't think Christianity is anti-female. Matter of fact, Christianity has done more to raise the status of women than any religious uh, movement in the world. The Islamic religion in its pure form does not raise up the value of women. I can go ahead and tell you that. Christianity really raised the value... It's, 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 sometimes it's how we men try to use the scriptures. The Bible says a wife is supposed to obey her husband. You tell me where it's in there. Matter of fact, it's not in there. The Bible never says that a wife is to obey her husband. But I'll tell you what it does say. If you don't believe me, look at Ephesians chapter 5, starting at verse 21. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. For no man has ever hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it. Even so, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. And wives, see that you respect your husband. Love generates respect. It is never in there about blind obedience. Now, I know it says in the King James, it uses the word submit. But that word submit in the original language more closely means to respect. Submission. That's, it never says obedience. Never says blind obedience. That's where people, and, and so in this female Bible, let me, I got away from it. 
In, in, in the female Bible, they actually changed every personal pronoun in reference to God was referred to when first that he, God is he, it was uh, changed to she. I, I'm not kidding. Yeah, it, it, it exists. It's out there. This is what we're talking about, liberationist and feminist criticism. I get this question asked all the time. And I know, I, I, I know we, we bring up homosexuality way too much. How can, how can the homosexual community read the Bible and justify their lifestyle? Because they use this form of interpretation. When God talked about a homosexuality, and, and the, look, there's no question, there is no question that the Bible talks about homosexuality, not only in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament. And those who want to take the Old Testament and throw it out, they, they, they use it. Well, that was Old Testament. It's in the New Testament too, children. But they use the logic well, that was based upon that culture. It was, it, it, it's, an, it's an outdated, antiquated ideology that God never intended because God loves everybody. Well, God may love everybody, but God doesn't love everything. Especially sin, because sin is offensive to God. But you see, when you come from this liberationist, which is, and it's not just homosexual, the homosexual community, I mean, there, there's others, who want to be set free from a what they consider an oppressive religious ideology. That's what they're saying. We, want to, we don't want to be under this oppressive ideology. God loves us like he loves everybody else. That is a way of justifying their sin. So, hey, look, it's easy. We all, we all do this. I messed on the women. I messed on the homosexual. Hom uh, well, I messed on, on, on that group. But we all do that. White people read the Bible from a right, white perspective. Right? I read the Bible through cultural eyes. I'm a southerner. I read the Bible through southern eyes. So therefore, sometimes I have to take and take the blinders off. Sometimes I have to say, okay, I've got to see the Bible for what it is. Said in the issue of slavery, y'all know this. Let me tell you something new. Preachers use the Bible to support the institution of slavery. They preached it from the pulpit. They preached that slaves were up in the galleries listening that slaves are mandated by God. It's because of the disobedience of people. It goes back uh, to, to two things, more than that, but it goes back to two things. It goes back to Cain. You've heard me, I've, I've mentioned it. It goes back to Cain. You remember when Cain killed Abel, God, and because God 
you know, called him into account for this and sent him away. And, 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 and Cain said, but, but what if they find out what I've done and they try to come against me? And so God said, I will put a mark on you that will keep people from touching you. And you know how that got to be interpreted? You know what, you know what people have taught that the mark upon Cain was? God turned him black. Yeah, that's, 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 that's been taught in black culture. That's how we became black. Because the mark on Cain was a curse. And so, therefore, white supremacies, supremacy groups... And if you're part of that, I hope you need to get out of it. You need to repent of it. But they teach that, and it, it, look, you've heard it. Some of you have even espoused it. That that is what makes white people superior to black people because God put a curse on Cain and turned him black. So therefore, that means that blacks are supposed to be subservient to white people because they're ignorant, they're dumb, they're stupid. Uh, even, e- even, in, even in, in slavery times, preachers from the pulpit uh, echoed out a false narrative that's, that Negroes, niggers, do not have a soul. They're nothing but animals. They don't have a soul. So therefore, we can beat them, we can mistreat them, we can even kill them without remorse because they're no more than an animal. That's, that, that's the heart. You know, was every slave owner like that? No. Did every slave owner buy that? No. But this was some of the justification that was used for enslaving people. Another part of this came from a misinterpretation of the Scriptures. And that is, you remember that after, oh God, it's 8 o'clock, that that after uh, the flood and and Noah and his sons came off the ark, and God told them uh, to, 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 to replenish the earth, be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth. And you remember that one of the things that Noah did is he, he planted a vineyard. And you remember what he did with the grapes? He made wine and got drunk. Now, maybe that's a justification for drinking wine, which maybe it's all right. I don't know. That's a whole whole other ballgame. That's a a whole other story. (laughs) But so Noah got drunk. You remember the three sons of Noah, Ham, Sham, and Japheth. You remember what Ham did? Now, we're not told what he did, but he did something. Because they said he went into the tent where his father was. Noah was blacked out drunk. And all it says is, is that Ham looked upon his nakedness. You ever wonder why drunks get get naked when they get drunk? They they, 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 they just they just they just shed their clothes. I, I tell you, I've dealt with a lot. I look, I have walked into a many drunk house. One of the last ones I did went in. The guy was naked as a jaybird, <laughs> drunk as a sc- he 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 got saved. He got delivered. <laughs> Believe it or not, he got. I mean, here I am looking at a naked man, and uh, and I finally t- I said, please. There were some pants. I said, please put those pants on. I, y- y'all think I, y'all don't know y'all don't know y'all don't know the road I have I have tread. Okay, let, let me finish this up. So, but all it says is that Ham looked upon the nakedness of his father. And then uh, Japheth and the other one. 
ham sham. I have to, I have to go through the list. Yeah, right, right. They come in and they take, they back in and they cover up their father. Now, so if you read that, you, 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 you know, how, how do you interpret that? But it says when, when, when Noah woke up and came to his senses, he realized what his son Ham had done to him. Now, I'm going to go ahead. That has been interpreted. Now, I don't know, I don't know that you can say it's 100%, but that has been interpreted that Ham committed some sort of homosexual act, sexual act on his father. And some, some believe, now I'm not, I'm, I'm not telling you that that is correct, because I don't know that any of us can fully understand, but Ham did something to his daddy, other than just look at him. Because how would, how would Noah know that his, something had been done to him? Because something was done, other than just he went in and peeked. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Might as well have a little fun along the way. So, so, so from that... From that, there's been two conjectures. This was the first act of homosexuality. This is, this is the first act of homosexuality recorded in the scriptures. But also, you remember that after this was over with, I got to project a little bit further. After all this was over with, and they started replenishing the earth, and you remember that a guy by the name of Nimrod rose up, and the people became really intelligent. And they built a city called the city, uh, where they, they it was it wasn't called that. that anyway, they determined let's build the tower up into the heavens. And God saw what they were doing. He said, "You know, if we don't do something to stop these people, there is no limit to what they can do." So He confused their language, and they called it Babel. Because they couldn't understand their language. So then they were forced to separate. Now, here, I'm, I'm going to tell you theory. Some conjecture that out of that, that the people of Ham, the descendants of Ham, primarily settled in Africa. What is Africa? The people of Sham, I think, settled more in Europe. And the people of Japheth, if I've got it right, settled more in the Orient. Which created your three basic classes of people. Your blacks, your Caucasians, and your Asians. Now, now don't go away and say, that's what our preacher told us, and it's got to be true. No, I ain't saying it's true. I'm just telling And be because Ham, they said there was a curse put on him. There was a curse put on Ham. And they say the curse that was put on him, that God, again, made him black. And he said he would be subservient to his brothers. So out of Ham, people say that's where the black race came from. And the curse was put on them. And therefore they became servants, slaves. This is interpretation. I can't tell it's real. I can't tell you that's what happened. Matter of fact, I, I don't believe that's what happened. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't believe that's how. It, I don't believe how it explains it. And I'll tell you some. I'll tell you how it explains it. But anyway, I'll leave you right there. Criticism. <laughs> you got to come back next week for the rest of the story. You see, what I'm trying to tell you 
is, is all this interpretation goes in and, and some of it can't be validated. Some of it can't be proven because we don't know. We want their stories are passed along, but we don't know if this is what happened or not. What was the curse of Ham? Now, there was a curse put on him, but what was the curse? I don't know. He was going to serve his brothers. Does that mean slavery? I don't know. Don't mean it had to be black. Let me tell you, there's been more enslaved people in this world than you can count on of every race, every creed, every color, uh, every, every, every denomination. Haven't you just been one group of people that's been enslaved? I've always said my, probably my folks were anywhere but last name of Butts had to be. <laughs> Couldn't been royalty. <laughs> Anyway, okay, that's enough of that. That's enough of that. Come back next week, and we'll continue the saga through the Bible. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you for being here. Okay, that, that's a, that, no problem, no problem. <laughs>